I know I haven't been publishing videos regularly for a while. If any of my regular viewers and subscribers are wondering, I'm still here, and I still plan to publish a lot more content. It's not a matter of running out of things to say, but more a matter of not having the time to upload a new video every week. People who have followed my channel for a while know that I'm not a full-time YouTuber. Other than a small donation every now and then, I really don't make any money doing this. I don't publish videos complaining that my videos were demonetized because my videos were never monetized to begin with. I do accept and appreciate donations, but I don't do this for money, and if I did, I'd have starved to death a long time ago. And the fact that I don't do this for money gives me a lot of freedom. I publish videos when I feel like it, and I talk about what I want to talk about. I don't do this to be popular either. If I did, believe me, I would be. I've been offered the opportunity to have my 15 minutes of fame at least three times that I can think of. It's not so much because I'm too strong to give in to temptation. It's more that it just isn't that much of a temptation for me. It's nice when I get a few new subscribers or when a video gets a few views and likes, but it really doesn't change my life in any way. And it's honestly just hard for me to understand why some people get so obsessed with how many views, likes, and subscribers they have. It's not like I get a dollar for every view I get. It's not like my subscribers pay a monthly subscription fee. I know it seems like I'm just rambling here, but I'm actually going somewhere. And it has to do with finding your life's purpose. So if you're interested in that, I invite you to keep listening. Sometimes I like to pencil in the dots first, and then draw the lines that connect them. And those who have taken geometry will know that this is often a useful practice. And after all, I am Pythagoras. Hypothetically, let's pretend that I did get a dollar for every video I publish. Let's imagine that my subscribers did each pay a small monthly subscription fee. Don't worry, this isn't a fundraising video. I'm not asking for your money or anything so crass as that. It's a rhetorical question. I'm making a point. What would that mean? Let's consider it. I think it's obvious that it would offer me an incentive to produce more videos and to produce videos of the quality that my viewers and subscribers expect from me. I already said that I don't do this for money, and that's the truth. But of course, we all need money to survive. And beyond our own concerns for our own personal survival, I think most of us have bigger visions that inspire us. And if we're realist, we have to admit that money tends to help us realize those visions and a lack of money can certainly be a hindrance. Believe me, I know that all too well. And I'm sure most of my viewers do as well. I think you can relate to having to work a job you hate in order to just pay the bills. But probably you aspire to do more than just simply paying the bills. You have some bigger dream. And if you don't, I think you need to search your heart and find out what you truly desire and who you truly are. And for some of you, simply discovering your true self may be the bigger dream at the moment. But I assure you that's only the beginning of the journey. Although in a sense, it's also the final destination. By that, I mean that in a sense, the purpose of life is self-actualization. But isn't it strange to think of self-actualization as the end rather than the beginning? You've achieved the goal of self-actualization. You've realized your authentic self. Is this the end? Is this death? Surely not. Surely this is only the beginning. This is birth. And if you believe in reincarnation and spiritual evolution, then maybe you'll say that Many cycles of birth and death and rebirth are necessary in order to reach this moment of true birth, this moment of true becoming, this moment of self-remembering. But now what? Having become God, will you commit divine suicide? 
Having spent nine months in the womb, will you emerge and say, I'm born, time to kill myself and enter again into the womb? This is an abomination. This is an abortion. Humanity is in the stage of becoming. Humanity is striving toward hyperhumanity. And in this primordial stage, becoming is the goal. Becoming seems to be the purpose. It appears to you as the finish line, as the omega point. Becoming has a purpose. Becoming has a goal. The goal and purpose of becoming is being. Being has no purpose. Being has no goal. And to someone who exists at the level of becoming, it will sound like, it will sound like I'm saying being is meaningless. Being is not meaningless. Being is meaningful. It's a question of intrinsic versus extrinsic meaning. Becoming has extrinsic meaning. That which is becoming exists in order to become something else. It's a means to an end. It serves a purpose in relation to something else. It has meaning in relation to something else. But it's this something else that has meaning in and of itself. It's this something else that gives purpose to everything else. What is the purpose of a chair? It's the person who sits in the chair who gives purpose to it. The chair has a purpose. The person has no purpose. The person gives purpose. The person is the source of purpose. If we agree that your ultimate purpose is to become God, then what is the purpose of God? If the goal of philosophy and the mystery schools is to know thyself or to dissolve the ego and identify with the true self, then what is the goal of the true self? The true self has no goal. The true self is the goal. Which is of greater value? That which exists as nothing more than a means to an end, or that which exists as an end in itself? Surely that which exists as an end in itself is of greater value. So is it logical for that which exists as an end in itself to despair that it has no purpose? Is it rational to suggest that a god should grow tired of eternal being and desire to commit suicide in order to return to the beginning and walk again in his own footsteps? Some so-called illuminists have promoted this absurd notion. But a truly illuminated person will see the insanity of this nihilistic philosophy of divine suicide and eternal recurrence. If the goal of life, reincarnation, and spiritual evolution is apotheosis, and if upon achieving apotheosis and becoming God, you simply kill yourself out of sheer boredom in order to return to the starting line and repeat the meaningless cycle over and over again, then what is the point of repeating the cycle? Just to return to your state of divine suicidal boredom again after several billion years of suffering? And then what? Then will you simply commit divine suicide again in order to return again after billions of years to where you are right now this very moment? If this is the case, then surely wisdom lies in fully accepting this present moment as the goal of your desire and striving. All your desire and striving will only inevitably lead you back to this present moment. So accept this moment. Stop striving to become and simply be. And in this very instant, you will achieve the ultimate goal of becoming. Even in the temporal world of becoming, you will find the eternal world of being. 
you'll have found nirvana in samsara. You'll have discovered that the kingdom of heaven is all around you. Most people are like hamsters running in a wheel. The hamster wheel is what they call samsara in Sanskrit. It's the world of becoming. The world of becoming is an illusion. Nothing can ever become what it isn't. All change is merely an illusion. A lot of modern, rational people think that Zeno's paradoxes are silly, even if they can't exactly solve them. And if any wise fool wants to claim that Zeno's paradoxes can be expressed as mathematical problems and solved using calculus, I'll be happy to give them a list of mathematical paradoxes, especially those involving zero and infinity. How can you use a paradoxical system such as mathematics to solve mathematical paradoxes, or any other paradox, such as Zeno's paradoxes, for that matter? Please explain that one to me. I'll wait. For a very small number of people, who are already probably pretty triggered at this point, if they've listened this far, I'm on the verge of speaking the ultimate blasphemy. And the fact that I have the audacity to publish such heresy under the name Pythagoras only adds insult to injury. Wasn't it Pythagoras who said, all is number? And didn't I myself publish a video entitled, all is number, which is still my most viewed video? Yes. And in fact, just this moment, I typed all is number into the search bar on YouTube, and my video was the top search result. But what's the subtitle? That's right. The illusion of matter and the reality of mind. And this is the original subtitle. I haven't changed it. I chose this subtitle on purpose. I suspect that a lot of people watched that video and thought they understood it, but really didn't. The subtitle reflects the Gnostic and esoteric view that the material world is an illusion. And it might surprise some people to learn that in Gnostic text, such as the hypostasis of the Archons, the terms the all and the one are not interchangeable. I consider myself a kind of non-dualist, so when I say the all and the one, are not the same. I'm not proposing a duality. It might seem this way if you assume that both exist, but only the one exists. The all is number. It's the material world. And I agree that the material world is governed by number. The material world is the world of illusion, the world of becoming. I can think of no better symbol for the world of becoming, the world of the all, than a number line extending from zero to infinity. This line, of course, contains all numbers. Every number from zero to infinity can be found on this line, and every point on this line can be defined by a number. To say that the line is an illusion is to say that number is an illusion, and this is easy to demonstrate. An infinite line is comprised of an infinite number of points. A point is zero-dimensional. So what is the sum of an infinite number of zeros added together? And if you agreed with me just a moment ago that every number is defined as a point on the line, then every number is zero. But what about infinity? For anyone who thinks the number line is real, it would appear that infinity is the opposite of zero. But clearly this is mathematically false. Any number added to its opposite is zero. So if infinity were the opposite of zero, then infinity plus zero should equal zero, right? Wrong. Infinity added to negative infinity equals zero. So the opposite of infinity is negative infinity. And to me, it still seems that the most perfect mathematical definition of zero is infinity plus negative infinity. So infinity isn't the opposite of zero. It's part of the nature of zero. And this is the key point. 
Infinity is part of the nature of zero. But zero is not a part of infinity. Zero itself is the whole. Is the purpose of the whole to become merely a part? This is the absurdity of those who conceive of spiritual evolution as a journey from zero to infinity on the number line. Is it evolution to move away from completeness toward incompleteness, from wholeness toward partiality? This is not evolution, but degeneration. In the political sphere, progressives share the same delusion. Many have begun to recognize them for what they truly are. Not progressives, but regressives. And of course, the religion of progress is as absurd as Abrahamism. If your purpose is to progress from zero to infinity, then your purpose can never be fulfilled. There is no salvation. You're eternally damned to suffer the curse of Sisyphus. I'm reminded of the Bible verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To put this in terms of geometry, every number falls short of infinity. You can never count to infinity. It isn't only because your lifetime is too short. Even if you lived forever, you could never count to infinity. And if God is infinity, then you could repeat an endless cycle of deaths and rebirths for all eternity and never become divine. But if God is zero, then just be still and know I am God. Every point on the number line is a zero. The infinite you're striving to become is what you already are. Infinity is part of the nature of zero, but it's only part. The other part is what you're repressing. It's what you're running away from. You're not running away from zero. You're not running away from God. God is everywhere. Every point along the number line is God. You can't run from yourself. Movement toward infinity is really movement away from negative infinity. It's running from your shadow. And you'll never escape from your shadow. And you can never become God by denying your shadow. You become God by integrating your shadow. This is to say that you'll never reach infinity by running away from negative infinity. Every point on the line is zero. And zero is negative and positive infinity. So wherever you run, negative infinity is there. Your shadow is there. Wherever you stop to sit and meditate, infinity is there. And of course, whether you're running toward positive infinity and away from negative infinity or the other way around, you're in the same trap. In the political sphere, we might compare this to reactionary conservatism. I do promote what some might see as a form of conservatism, but this doesn't mean that I align myself with the so-called conservative party. Conservatives tend to see the past as a golden age, and they project their fear onto the future. They're deeply concerned with where the country is headed. And this is an interesting point because it raises the question of whether anti-Trumpers are actually progressive or conservative. Supposedly, conservatives are afraid of change, but many progressives are afraid that America is changing under Trump, or that Trump's election represents a changing country. Maybe they want to return to the past golden age of Obama. But I say this only to point out the oversimplification that many people are guilty of. It isn't that progressives are for change and that conservatives are against change. They just have alternative visions for the future. And both of their visions are rooted in the past, at least to a degree. There's nothing really new about statism, Marxism, and identity politics. The left doesn't really have any new ideas. But if we look at Obama's slogan, hope and change. 
compared to Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, it's easy to see why these popular, simplistic stereotypes exist. Hope and change almost seems to imply that the past is something to run from. Hope, apparently, lies in the belief that things can change, that things can finally be different from the way they've always been. We're promised a new world order to replace the old world order. On the other hand, make America great again almost seems to imply that the past is something to run back to. And I don't want to reduce everything down to slogans, but I think the contrast is interesting. And to be fair, I think both candidates had effective campaigns. Of course, Obama never actually delivered on the hope and change he promised. He promised a new world order, but pretty much served as a puppet of the old world order. And I'm still waiting on Trump to make America great again. He may turn out to be just as much a servant of the new world order as Obama was of the old world order. As far as I can tell, the new world order is the same as the old world order. Like the farm animals at the end of Animal Farm, I look from pig to human and from human to pig, and I can't tell one from the other. They all want power. They all want control. Whether you're a right-wing fascist or a left-wing socialist, you want a totalitarian state. Why do I care whether I'm a slave to one system or another? The point is to be free. And no, I don't think there's anything smart about trying to create a synthesis between two different forms of tyranny. The point is to resist tyranny. Liberty should concern itself with the present. Liberty allows the present to be without attempting to force it to become. Liberty is being. Tyranny is becoming. Left-wing tyranny wants to force the present to become like some imagined utopian future. Right-wing tyranny, some might say, wants to force the present to become like some imagined utopian past. If you synthesize two imaginary fantasies together, this won't lead you to reality. Instead, you have to let go of both fantasies and see reality clearly. I don't promote the fantasy of returning to some golden old world order, or the fantasy of ushering in some utopian new world order. If anything, I promote living authentically in the now world order. The golden old world order and the utopian new world order are both fantasy. And as long as you live in either fantasy, you'll find yourself in conflict with reality. The only reality is the now world order. You have to accept that you live in the world you actually live in, and not the world you wish you lived in. This doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't work to create change. Accepting the world as it is also means accepting your role within it. And of course, this means you must know yourself. Radical progressive ideologies and reactionary conservative ideologies both reject the world as it is. And so ultimately, they deny the value of your individual identity in it. For them, you exist only as a catalyst. You have no intrinsic worth. You're a means to an end, not an end in yourself. They demand that you sacrifice yourself to the movement. They demand that you deny your identity as an individual and define yourself as a part of the collective. In exchange, they offer the promise of becoming a part of something greater than yourself. Consider this phrase, becoming a part of something greater than yourself. In light of what I've already said, the collectivist wishes to enslave you in the world of becoming, in the world of illusion, in the world of number. And for the collectivist, you're nothing more than a number. The collectivist sees you as merely a part. They offer partiality, not wholeness. They deny you wholeness. To return to the language of number symbolism, 
For then, you're nothing more than a number. Your value and identity is reducible to a finite point on a number line which stretches toward infinity, but never reaches it. For them, the infinite is greater than the finite, and you're only finite. For them, you exist in order to worship the infinite, to worship the all, to worship God. But of course, as I've pointed out, Infinity is only half of zero, and it's appropriate that the Gnostics called the false god of the material world of becoming, the Demiurge. Demi means half. The Demiurge is the god of infinity. He is the god of becoming. He is the god of human sacrifice. He demands the sacrifice of your individual identity and value. He is the god of all collectivist religions, whether theistic or secular. He is the god of conservative and progressive political ideologues. He is the god of the Garden of Eden, or the Golden Old World Order. And he is the god of the Utopian New World Order. He is the god of materialistic atheists, just as much as he is the god of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Unlike some, I do see Christianity differently than I see Judaism and Islam, though. This is a side note, which would require a separate video to delve into fully. But to put it briefly, Judaism and Islam are both Abrahamic religions. Christianity isn't. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So clearly, we can't properly understand Jesus as a teacher of Abrahamism. He is called a priest in the order of Melchizedek, a priest of El Elyon, the Most High God, the God of the Canaanite or Phoenician people, the God of Jesus and Pythagoras, not the Demiurge, not the God of Abraham or the Jewish people, who, according to the Jews themselves, invaded the land of Canaan and committed genocide against the Canaanite people. Melchizedek was a priest of Salem. Salem is the ancient name for Jerusalem. It was a holy city dedicated to the Most High, before the Jews seized power and made it the center of worship for the Demiurge. Could this be what Jesus really meant when he drove out the money changers, who are the same as the Jewish Zionist bankers of today, from the temple? and accused them of turning his father's house, El Elyon's holy temple, into a den of thieves and robbers. Jesus told the Jewish priest that their father was the devil. Consider the words of Christ when he says, Greater is he that is in thee than he that is in the world. The meaning of this is that the God within you, or your true self, is greater than the false God of this world. The God of zero is greater than the God of infinity. Jesus seems to have been a member of the Nazarene community, which is extremely closely related to the Pythagorean Brotherhood. Jesus believed in the same God Pythagoras believed in, the Canaanite Phoenician God El Elyon, not the Israelite Hebrew God Jehovah. Although it's commonly believed that Jesus was a Jew, many researchers contest this. I recommend reading a book called Jesus the Phoenician, but this is just one of several books related to this subject. It's not a subject I can fully discuss here, and I'm not here to spoon feed anyone. It's never been my purpose to publish a grand unified theory of everything that everyone can understand in a three-part video series. In fact, I don't claim to have anything at all to teach. Teachers of the religions of the Demiurge offer final answers. I offer initial questions. In other words, I offer initiation into the mysteries. Nothing more. My entire sermon is merely, know thyself and do as thou wilt. But what does this mean in terms of the now world order? Rather than continue speaking in very abstract, philosophical, metaphorical, symbolic language, I'd like to return to where I began, and speak in very simple and this-worldly language. I'd like to return our attention to a more practical and less speculative craft. 
and unfortunately some will find this less entertaining. But this is the question before you, this very moment, here and now. Who are you, and what is your role in the world as it exists? Not in the world you wish you lived in, but in the world you actually live in. In other words, what should you do with your life? How should you live? This is the central question of practical philosophy. And I think that if we seek to answer this question first, then the higher questions of speculative philosophy will be revealed to us. Obviously, it isn't a question that I or anyone else can answer for you, but I'll offer you a way of beginning to approach the question, which I believe will be helpful. I think it's obvious that, unless you're alive, the question of what should I do with my life is absolutely useless. So survival comes first on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I would suggest that, in some ways, the very struggle for survival guides us into the very heart of the struggle towards self-actualization. So it isn't linear. It isn't sequential. It isn't hierarchical. The struggle for survival and the quest for self-actualization are both imminent and interconnected. The manner in which you choose to survive reveals your true nature and character. Do you adopt a survival strategy that's based on exploiting and cheating others? Do you attempt to secure your own welfare through the initiation of violence? Or do you attempt to support yourself and others in your community by offering something of value to others? The first question might trigger a progressive to think of the stereotypical rich, greedy capitalist. The second question may conjure up the image of a stereotypical bloodthirsty socialist in the mind of a conservative. Interestingly, though, I think the third question will probably strike both the progressive and the conservative as being more in alignment with their own ideals. And since this is the ideal I promote, I hope to be able to appeal to both sides to consider an alternative to the left-wing, right-wing paradigm. It's no secret that I basically align myself with libertarian and anarcho-capitalist ideas, along with some nationalistic ideas. But I think it might be a mistake to project the goal of a voluntary society onto an imaginary utopian future. I fear this can only lead us away from being and into the abyss of becoming. I'm skeptical that humanity can ever become liberated. But I believe each human can be liberated right now. This liberated individual already lives in a voluntary society. And the one law of this secret voluntary society is know thyself and do as thou wilt. And every member of this now world order lives according to the third survival strategy and considers each of the first two to be immoral. And by immoral, I essentially mean contrary to their true nature and will. They support themselves and others within their community by offering value to others and receiving value from others in return. Every individual has certain abilities and talents. And if they use those abilities and talents to meet the needs of their community, their needs will be met by the community. To put this in very ordinary terms, if someone opens a restaurant and that restaurant serves the kind of food that people in that area want to eat at a price they find fair and reasonable, then the restaurant owner will do well. If a singer is talented and people enjoy hearing her sing, then they will buy tickets to hear her sing. They'll be willing to pay for her music. So she'll be able to survive by singing. If she isn't very talented, she can still sing if she wants to, but she has no right to demand that people pay her a living wage to sing. 
Maybe if she really wants to be a singer, she could take voice lessons, and maybe she could improve her singing. And then maybe she could make a living as a singer. Or maybe she's already a great singer, but no one knows about her, and she doesn't know how to promote herself or her music. Just because she isn't able to make a living as a singer, at the moment, doesn't necessarily mean she has no talent. But very often, I think there's a relationship between what someone is best at and what they're able to earn the most doing. Not always, but I think there's a relationship. And this is why I say that the struggle for survival is connected with the quest for self-actualization. At least more often than not, the goal of surviving requires you to discover your talents and abilities. And this is also essential to the goal of self-actualization. And your income is a reflection of how much value other people in your community place on what you offer to the community. I'm only saying that it, it's a reflection of how much value other people place on what you offer. I'm not necessarily saying their assessment is accurate. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Maybe a lot of people place value on mindless entertainment, and so people who are good at producing mindless entertainment will be well rewarded. This doesn't necessarily mean there's any real value in what they offer. And maybe an ideal utopian society wouldn't place so much value on mindless entertainment. And for a while, to be honest, I felt some resentment toward people who are able to earn a lot of money providing the kind of mindless entertainment that other people are willing to pay for. I spent a couple of years working on an ambulance, and I remember thinking that it was very unfair that first responders make so much less compared to idiotic reality TV show personalities. Maybe in a more meritocratic world, someone who actually helps to save lives would be paid more than some reality TV show freak who can put a hook through his nose. But again, we have to live in the world we actually live in, and not the world we wish we lived in. In the world I actually live in, EMTs earn a fairly low income. I knew how much the job paid when I applied for the job, and even before that, when I enrolled in the program at my local college. This was what I chose to do. No one forced me. I was free to do it or not to do it. I suppose I was free to put hooks through my nose if I wanted to, and maybe I could have been a reality TV personality if I had. But that isn't what I wanted to do, and I'm glad no one forced me to. But if someone else wants to do that, why should anyone else tell them they can't? And if someone else is willing to pay them a certain amount to be on a reality TV show about carnival freaks or whatever, why should anyone else tell them how much they're allowed to pay him or how much he's allowed to be paid? This is a voluntary exchange between two parties. It doesn't concern anyone else. Maybe I don't think someone deserves to be paid much, if anything at all, for putting a hook through their nose, but no one is taking money away from me to give it to him. So it's fine. Maybe a leftist would say he doesn't deserve to have that money and that someone else, like an EMT who serves his community while struggling to pay the rent in a cheap apartment in a poor neighborhood, deserves it more. And hypothetically, if there is anyone listening who has made money as a reality TV personality who puts hooks through his nose or something like that, and who also promotes left-wing political ideas, such as the redistribution of wealth, there's no need for him to wait until some future utopian New World Order government forces people like him to give their undeserved money away to people like me. He can make a voluntary donation right now through my website at IlluminatusPythagoras.com. Or he can agree with me that he is entitled to keep whatever he's earned, and so is everyone else. I'll check my PayPal balance over the next few weeks to discover whether any such individual exists or not. Or perhaps such an individual does exist, but he's nothing more than a hypocrite and a charlatan. Or perhaps such an individual once lived, but now he's in the morgue. I guess there's no way to know for sure. Obviously, I'm just having a bit of fun with this purely fictitious character, 
But I'd like to think I've made a couple of serious points along the way as well. So like I said, money and income can sometimes be a useful way of measuring how much aptitude you have for what you're doing, or at least how much value others in your community place on what you're doing. So if you aren't earning enough income to survive, driving a taxi, maybe you're not a bad taxi driver. Maybe you're a great taxi driver, but maybe your society doesn't need another taxi driver all that much. So they're not willing to voluntarily pay a living wage to someone just to drive a taxi. Or at least the market won't support more than a certain amount of individuals in that specific occupation. You can still do it if you want to, but you can't demand that other people should be forced by the government to pay you a living wage for it. It isn't personal. It isn't that they want you to starve or be homeless. They just don't want another taxi driver all that much. Maybe they want something else. Find out what they want. Find out what the needs of the community are. If you can offer them that, instead of offering them something they don't want or need, then they'll give you money and you'll be able to earn a living wage. And if anyone thinks I'm putting down taxi drivers, I'm not. I drove a taxi myself for a little while, and I enjoyed it. I had some interesting conversations with a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life. To anyone who enjoys listening to my videos, maybe the idea of having Illuminatus Pythagoras drive you to the airport sounds kind of cool. But maybe that isn't the best use of my talents. And it certainly wasn't a very financially profitable use of my time. And maybe if I had been able to earn a decent income just driving a taxi or limo, I would have kept doing it. I honestly did enjoy it. In a way, though, I'm grateful that I wasn't able to make enough to make ends meet doing that. It forced me to consider other things that I could do with my time that would be more profitable. In other words, to look for needs and wants in my community that I have the ability to supply. It forced me to look for another job that paid more. In other words, to look for a job that's in more demand, a service that my community had a greater need for, or at least a greater perceived need or desire for. And this is the beauty of a free economy. At least to a large degree, Wherever there is want or need in a community, there is an incentive for someone to fulfill that want or need. This is the basic idea of supply and demand. And I don't think we can reduce everything to economics, at least not unless we think about the economy in a far broader sense, which includes all forms of social transactions and forms of value that can't be measured in dollars. If I say that a smartphone is a wonderful tool that can do many wonderful things. This doesn't mean that I'm claiming that a smartphone by itself is the solution to every problem in your life. Some libertarians focus obsessively on Austrian economics, and it's fine to learn about Austrian economics. And I definitely support the idea of a free market. But a voluntary society is more than just a free market. Capitalism and the profit motive aren't everything. A healthy, voluntary society will obviously include all kinds of voluntary community charity organizations, nonprofits, religious and social groups, and so on. These things arise naturally out of the freedom of voluntary association. Supporting capitalism doesn't mean that you want to reduce all human interactions, and even humans themselves, to mere economic transactions or economic units. You would be at least equally justified in saying the same thing of socialism. Of course, this is unfair in both cases, because both capitalism and socialism are only economic theories and nothing more. Capitalism is the idea that it's better to have a free economy, which is regulated by market forces such as supply and demand. Socialism is the idea that it's better to have a controlled economy, which is regulated by state force and central government planning. I think history shows which system is actually better and more efficient. 
But to say that not every problem in the world can be reduced to economics or thought of in economic terms is simply to admit that neither capitalism or socialism is the answer to everything. So this objection to capitalism is not an argument in favor of socialism. As far as economic problems go, capitalism offers far superior solutions compared to socialism. And as far as problems that capitalism might not be able to solve because they aren't economic in nature, socialism can't solve them either for the same reason. So socialism is useless. There's nothing to gain by trying to synthesize capitalism and socialism. We could only succeed in creating a new failed economic theory. But of course we need more than economic philosophy. We also need moral philosophy and the other branches of philosophy. And so obviously I wouldn't encourage anyone to approach the question of what they should do with their lives from a purely economic perspective. I'm only suggesting that the economic perspective can be useful too, especially if you're concerned with things like surviving, having food to eat, having shelter, access to medical care, being able to support children, and things like this. And I'll admit that these are things that are on my mind right now. And this is why I've directed my time and energy toward other things and away from publishing videos for free. Like I said at the beginning, aside from small donations here and there, I really don't make any money off of these videos, and I really don't do it for the money. If I did see more of a demand, or if I thought I could support myself as a full-time content creator, I would definitely consider doing that, but I don't want to be the guy who's constantly asking his viewers for money to support his channel. But I don't mind saying that if anyone has found value in my videos and would like to say thank you by making a small donation, I definitely appreciate that. And I'm considering setting up something where if people want me to publish a video, answering a particular question, or discussing a certain topic, they can send their request along with a donation of a certain amount. This is something I'm considering making available, but I'm still not sure. Either way, I will still be publishing more, so stay tuned. I know this video has been all over the place, but I hope you found something of value in it compared to all the mindless entertainment that's freely and abundantly available on YouTube and all over the internet. Thanks for listening. Peace.